See, I, I I, it was way sexier before coming down into it. I've seen a lot of guys Look, have it coming down. Nobody, listen, this is about sound. Your sound was messed up last time. Point it up. We're golden. It's also about sex appeal. Hold on. <laughs> that shirt's not too sexy. something trillion dollars here's the thing so it was reported that uganda through one of their i think their mining and energy minister reported that the country had identified 320,000 metric tons of or roughly 320,000 metric tons of gold in the country i can't remember which regions of the country but it was like west or south or anyway it's all online so the, the, the internet went crazy over this because, for some context, 320,000 metric tons of gold would be worth somewhere around $12 trillion. It's insane. It's an insane number. And the world only produces about 3,000 metric tons annually. So it's, it's a big claim. So I wanted to look into it more because it was making its rounds on the internet. And even a lot of legitimate media publications were, were writing about it as if this massive motherload gold discovery had been made in Uganda. But the reality is, is, is quite a bit different. So I dug a little bit into it. All I could find really was the ministry in Uganda who's responsible for mining and energy. Apparently, they did some sort of airborne surveys, some geophysics, some geochem work, and that's how they came up with this number, 320 or so thousand metric tons of gold within, I think it was 30 million tons of ore. You're talking about grades. Uh, I mean, this is somewhere in that 80 to 100 grams per ton range. Like this would be absolutely insane. Oh, no, no, it's insane. No, I don't believe that. I don't yeah, believe that. I, I think not to bash them. I'm not saying they're lying. I think this is extremely optimistic with some serious promotion involved. So... It was interesting because before this news came out, and you've been actually writing about this a lot, before this news came out, they said that in Parliament, uh, the Uganda government apparently passed a law that entitles the government to 15% ownership in all mines in the country now. Furthermore, mm -hmm. furthermore, there's also production agreements. I don't know what those look like. It was probably some, yeah. sort, of N some sort of NSR of some sort. Yeah, But we know this is a segue, or at least historically, we've seen a lot of countries in South America and Africa do this in the past. Where NSR, used... Yeah, NSR stands for Net Smelter Royalty for any new yeah. listeners. So a lot of companies will option off a project and they'll retain a 1% or a 2% NSR. And it just gives them, you know, kind of the project is ever to go into production. There's, you know, lifetime recurring revenue of the mine. But continue. Exactly. And a 1% or 2% NSR is... It's very reasonable, very normal. But when you get into those nationalistic or socialistic type of governments, those numbers can skyrocket very quickly when you have some success. So I just think this reeks of nationalization of, of assets. And we've seen so many examples in the past of this happening where a government will say, look, this kind of, our country is amazing. It's mineral rich. Here's a great area. We're encouraging foreign investment to come on in and, and, and help us develop our resource-rich nation. So we've seen that many times. And Uganda's no, no exception. The president came on and uh, made a big speech about this um, potential discovery. And basically, they're inviting um, global mining players into the country to come help them develop this, these resources, these deposits. And in many uh, instances in history, it's been Canadians. I'm very proud of the history of Canada. We are the number one explorers and mineral devel developers on the planet. Our geologists and prospectors are amongst the best in the world and often Easily. called yeah, exactly, and often called upon to, to start uh, developing these sorts of deposits. So I know we're going to see some venture companies, some TSX venture companies and p p possibly CSE companies making their way into into Uganda soon enough. 
But I would say uh, exercise a little bit of caution because I watched the speech from the president after they announced this, you know, twelve trillion potential twelve trillion dollars worth of gold in their in their dirt, and it was a little bit. Uh, there was some there was some uh, rhetoric in there that was pretty anti foreigner, um, pretty uh, almost combative. We'll include a link in our description to his speech. But to mm-hmm. me, to me, if I was running a TSX venture or TSX mining company or explorer, and I was looking to go take some risks in a foreign land, I don't know if I would be quick to jump into Uganda just just given the, the language uh, that they're using. And I would also say that the way in which they're explaining, uh, the Ugandan government is explaining how gold-rich the country probably is, this would not pass the grade from a regulatory perspective in Canada or the U.S. There's no company... Um, on the venture that could go out and make these types of claims without getting in serious regulatory trouble, without putting drill bits in the ground and coming up with an actual resource cal, 43101 compliant resource calculation. Everything I've read about this mother load discovery, it's geocam, geophys, and uh, airborne surveys. This is step one of probably 20 exploratory steps needed. And they need to put drills in the ground, and there needs to be resource calculations galore <clears throat> before I would say that this is legitimate. Twelve trillion dollars exceeds the entire market cap of all gold ever mined in human history. Okay, I think Crazy. it's around ten or eleven trillion total. Resource nationalism is on the rise everywhere you look, all over the world. Politicians are looking to blame companies; they're looking to raise capital by any means necessary. Um, you know, you name the country in Latin America and Africa, we've seen it. Um, Ecuador, you can think back to Fruto del Norte, most recently in Chile. Yeah. Um, you know, the new uh, socialists who got in power there, they're looking at a huge tax um, on miners. Uh, just today, France says EU can implement global minimum tax without Hungary, right? So taxes are going up. Uh, governments are looking for ways to fund social programs. And a lot of people see mining as low hanging fruit. Right. Um, you know, like who does it really impact? Just the shareholders? Right. Uh, you know, if you can get the percentage of the vote, it's uh, that's it's a, a great one. that's a great point too, is is kind of mi- mining is the it is a low hanging fruit. It's an easy target because yeah. if you're in Especially if you're, foreign mining companies. Yeah, well well said. So it oftentimes is Canadian or American companies going in. And developing these these assets, these deposits, because look, we have the sophistication. It's kind of in our DNA to explore, to wildcat, to develop, to create mines, to build them up, and get the yeah. financing. That's what that's one of the beautiful things about the TSX venture. It allows the public to share in the risk of some of these speculative ventures. And oftentimes, just just in Canadian Canadians DNA is to go after natural resource development and. It's such an easy target, as you say, because of the environmental uh, implications that mines bring with them. So, of course, yeah. locals will get behind a government that says, "You know what? We're gonna we're we're gonna increase the our ownership rights in all mines, even though we said it was previously blank percent. We're not gonna bump that up fifty percent. Oh, by the way, that NSR that was two percent is now five percent, and nobody yeah. in the country is gonna complain. There's no face." To the victim, the victim would be the mining company and its shareholders. There's no face to the to the no. to the victims in the in the local no. country. So, no. I think, um, yeah, I think first of all, I think the Uganda thing is highly speculative. Still, it needs to be proven out. And I think secondarily, um, there's a lot of uh, potential for resource nationalism. I mean, the law they already passed in Parliament is significant. I wouldn't say that this is even close to a done deal, and I don't even know if they actually have that much gold in the ground. And even if they do, good luck getting it out. I mean, even in Canada, we have our own issues with getting our natural resources out of the ground, and we're an advanced nation with very uh, defined laws on on development. So, to me, it's a it's a nothing burger, and I don't think it's going to be a significant issue for the price of gold. If it was true, if this was developed, and there was resource calculations to back it up, and perhaps some feasibility studies, then the price of gold would sink probably fifty percent overnight. But there isn't. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. If anyone believed that there was $12 trillion worth of gold there, um, more than the entire market cap of all gold ever mined, um, and in existence, yeah, the price would fall dramatically. Listen, if you're if you're speculating and investing in a country like Uganda, and you're not sure how risky it is, uh, the Fraser Institute puts out an annual mining survey 
where they basically rank the investment attractiveness of every nation, country, province in the world. And uh, last year's, the one that came out in 2022 for 2021, they looked at 84 jurisdictions. Uganda wasn't even one of them. Some hmm. of the countries and regions are so, um, you know, unpredictable and volatile that they can't even rank them. Okay, so, you know, if it's not making it even into the survey, you know you're, you're kind of in uh, murky waters, as it were. But yeah, the index is weighted 40% to policy and 60% to mineral potential. And one other thing I want to add just about gold in general and, and, and gold deposit development and gold mine development is there's a reason gold holds its value so well and there's a reason it's so expensive. And that is it's not necessarily because of scarcity of gold in the Earth's crust. What makes gold valuable is the fact that it's extremely difficult to extract economically from the Earth. So mm -hmm. for every... For every gold mine that comes up, there's 999 exploration projects that fail. And that blew two, five, 10, 20, $50 million on these deposits that went, ended up going nowhere. This is why gold holds its values. This is one of the reasons why gold holds its value so much. Extremely hard to extract economically. And economically <clears throat> doesn't just mean grams per ton and how rich the deposit is. It means geopolitical risk. It means timing the cycle. Obviously, grade does matter. Price of energy. There's so many things that go into a profitable go or that go into a successful um, gold asset mm -hmm. that we can't just, we can't, the Bitcoin, and I'll just go back to the Bitcoin crowd. They want to poo poo gold right now for who knows why, but I think because it's competitive reasons. Yeah. But it's not about the fact that there's a lot of gold in the, in this world. It's about how do you get it out econo excuse me, economically and, how, and, and is it in a jurisdiction that will even allow it? So you could be mining gold for five years and if you're in the wrong jurisdiction with the wrong government, your NSR goes up, your, your ownership interest goes down overnight. And that's why it's, it's, uh, it has, one of the reasons why it has such a high failure rate. There's so many variables into these gold deposits that the Bitcoin argument to me is, is out the window. It's not just mm -hmm. about scarcity. It's, uh, it's, it's not really the point. All right, I think that about wraps it up for another pod. Don't forget to like and subscribe.